everyone. Good morning and welcome. If you have not found your seat quite yet, now is the time to do so. Thank you all so much for being here today and joining us for the Foundation Summit, supporting student well being. I'm Ashley Prelo. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Student Success, Thriving and Retention. And I, thank you. All right. <laughs> and I'm really delighted to be here today and see all of you in person, as well as those that have joined virtually. We are so excited to have you. So without further ado, I know we have a very exciting day planned ahead. I want to kick us off by introducing our fearless and most devoted leader, President Sylvia Burwell. Ashley, thank you so much for that introduction and your energy and your passion for building bridges throughout higher education and with all of us. We're so glad. It's hard to believe that you've only been here six months. I'm sure everybody kind of feels that in terms of you are a part of this fabric. Um, and we are so excited you're here. I also want to thank Jeff. Where's Jeff? I saw Jeff coming in. Bridget is Brid Bridget's right there too. Anna, I saw you Anna, coming when I was coming in. Um, and the entire student thriving and retention team for putting this event together because I love this. I am actually so excited when Ashley asked. It's like, of course, um, I wanted to come and, and kick this off. And I did because, you know, I think uh, I love that it's university wide and it's university wide, which I love us all working together across. And it is a topic that there is not a single day advancement and this topic that I do not speak about, focus on, and that sort of thing. So I'm so excited um, to be here and, and have this be a part of what I'm doing on this issue today. Um, I'm also excited because we're joined by some of AU's newest members of our team. And I think everybody in this room has met, and I know we're gonna do um, more formal introductions. Ashley is gonna do that. But I just you know, wanna highlight in terms of, we have some of our new fo folks who are top leaders in their field and who are really gonna help us take our student thriving retention graduation efforts to the, its next level. And you're gonna hear from them in a moment. So I'm not gonna uh, go into more than that, but I did wanna welcome Raymond and Evelyn and Bridget uh, in terms of, um, you know, I hope you're gonna experience um, over and over again, what we do, which it is an inspiring place. Um, and the people here are inspiring in this team that we're working with on that issue. I, I look forward to you all. We welcome you and we look forward to you experiencing that as well. And also I wanna mention Vicki, um, who uh, everyone knows um, and is not new to the AU community for sure, but she is new in her role. And just to say, thank you, Vicki, um, to come into this role uh, with the energy uh, and excitement um, of this important role and engaging in this issue. So we have a year and a great year ahead. Um, and as I was getting ready for this event, I kind of started thinking about the word foundation and it can conjure up many images, building blocks, scaffolding, bedrocks, uh, construction kind of metaphors, but it also is about community and mission. If you take it to that 30,000 foot level, when I was thinking about why is this called the Foundations Summit? Um, and to me, this idea of community, mission and impact are really an important part of the foundation of who we are uh, as a university. And if we're gonna keep going, we're gonna keep building that foundation and fulfilling our mission, we're gonna advance knowledge, we're gonna foster intellectual curiosity, build community, and empower lives of service and leadership. And in order to do that, we actually have to make sure that every student feels supported, they feel challenged, and they feel empowered. And so we've done a great job in the last few years. I want to recognize incredible work that has been done despite daunting challenges of all sorts. Um, we launched the Center for Wellbeing, uh, giving our students streamlined and expanded services in terms of that. Uh, we are seeing benefits in terms of, if you look at our numbers, we are ranked in the 99th percentile for outcomes uh, in terms of that work for students with anxiety, 
which is our most common, I think many of you all know, mental health challenge for our students. And across the campus, we're implementing a holistic approach. And that I'm sure is gonna be a theme of this conversation throughout. And that's why I'm so excited everybody is here because it's a holistic approach and helping our unique populations of students get what they need to be physically healthy, to be mentally healthy, and to be socially uh, healthy as we work through all this. And from our new $109 million student thriving complex, the largest investment this university is making in the history of the university uh, in terms of student thriving, uh, to the efforts that each of you make each day to empower individual uh, students, you know, as we think through this, to create <laughs> very important and something we've been working on for years, a sense of belonging and inclusion in terms of our inclusive, excellent work. All of it's going to come together and you're talking about it all today. Um, we're focused on retention and graduation as a measure and an outcome that's really important. And it's not only critical to our mission, it is also critical to our economics and how we work. And I know that you all know that. And it's really great, Ashley, that you've helped us get a comprehensive plan in place that I know you all are going to be discussing. And I just really, most important in terms of my time here is to take a moment to say thank you. Um, thank you to all of you all who've been a part of developing these plans, of implementing this work, and come with your game every day, um, no matter what we've got in front of us. And so really the most important part is a huge, huge Thank you for what you've done and thank you for what you're gonna do. So I know we're gonna work on a lot of questions. You know, what are the interventions, biggest differences in retention and student thriving? How can we do that? How do we create a greater sense of belonging and connectedness to this university? I do wanna say to you all, I think the bar has kind of been raised for us with the court decisions and not just um, the decision on race, conscious admissions, but also the LGBTQ decision that the court handed down. And so I think just, you know, it is an important contextual point for us that I think we need to remember that that bar got raised on important work that we were already focused on, but the external context, I think, changed that some. And so I think that'll inform our work this year. Um, how can we best work together across teams? Um, because that also sends that signal that modeling of what we're talking about with inclusion and how it works uh, and modeling what they do. So all of these things are really at their core are about the fact that we are partners in this effort. You all are where the rubber meets the road in both our mission and our impact. And I'm grateful for all that you want to do and are going to do this year. And I know that we're all here because we actually all believe that our students are the change makers for tomorrow uh, that are gonna make this world uh, a better place. So I know we share that in terms of that common thing that drives us all. So I wanna thank you all for coming together today uh, and taking the time. It is a busy time as we're all looking at each other. It's already August. They're gonna be here very, very soon. Um, and just thanks to everybody for being here today for what you do and what we're going to get done and this exciting year that we are going to have when the new students come and our other students return. So thanks to everybody. I'm going to turn everything back over to Ashley, and I hope you all have a great, great day. Ashley. Thank you, President Burwell, for your encouraging words and your supportive leadership. And at this point, I would like to introduce some of our new leaders that have recently joined us here at American University. So to start, I will turn it over to Raymond O, our new Vice President for Student Affairs. Well, thank you very much. It's terrific to see all of you here. Um, my name is Raymond O, oh, and I know that's probably among your questions, how to pronounce my last name. Uh, that's the uh, question I've been getting the most from all of the wonderful campus community members. Also a shout out to those of you joining us virtually this morning. We are so excited to see all of you. Um, so I've been given three minutes or Ashley will get the big hook. Uh, so I'm going to try to be brief, but hopefully 
connect with you um, personally as well, because we are part of a greater team, as President Burwell has said. So I'm going to quickly talk about my background, um, some experiences that, that are meaningful for me, and then I'm going to move very quickly into how student affairs may fit with what you do, both uh, in administratively and also inside and outside of the classroom, because again, we are talking about holistic well being. Um, first of all, Raymond O, oh, again, originally from Taiwan, um, and my family immigrated to the United States when I was about 10. And so I actually grew up in North Carolina since the age of 10. So it was a tough place, but a good place to grow up. First career is I wanted to be a concert pianist and midway through wonderful mentors and student affairs really recruited me. No, no, you don't wanna just play piano all day. You should, you should come and do what we do as student affairs for a living. And that has been fantastic and a wonderful opening to getting a second master's in clinical counseling and finally a, um, a doctorate in education. So that's a bit of my background. So often um, you may hear me use um, words that sound a little clinical, but I will not ask you how you're feeling, okay? Um, so as a counselor, but that's sort of uh, the orientation there. Some career highlights, um, as I mentioned uh, with some of our IAP colleagues, so just a quick shout out to all of you there. I worked at Yale College, uh, focused on first year programs. I also worked at Simmons University, focused primarily on the graduate professional programs, as well as the undergraduate programs and also online programs. And when we talk about student thriving and well-being, I do mean all of our students. Um, I was also at Tufts University as the second person in the organization for a comprehensive student affairs um, uh, division. And then most recently, I was the vice president of student affairs at Brandeis University. Uh, but I will say, despite being in so many different places, this is by far the most energetic, positive, and complex place that I've been. Love your acronyms. Keep coming at me with them. IAP, CDO, you know, all sorts of things. I'm tempted to make up a few to see if you catch, uh, catch me. So anyway, when we think in student affairs about, uh, we, we think about, yes, how do we have direct interventions, whether it's partnering with Ashley, Evelyn, and others, but we also think about the indirect ways in which we create sense of belonging, students' satisfaction, school spirit, the vibrancy of the programs on campus. And when we think about foundations, I also have an image in my head. How many of you are aware of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So in student affairs, we have a team dedicated to the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Some of the foundation points are things, for example, interim AVP of student affairs, Jeff Brown, his team, health um, counseling, chaplaincy, conduct, all of those factors build the foundation. Also, Dane Hutchinson, our AVP student engagement and success, we uh, look to orientation, housing, um, safety, and many of the other places to help students thrive as leaders. All of that is how we think about holistic well-being and development. So it's not just one dimension. Yes, we want to make sure our students behave, but we also want to make sure that they thrive. And when we think about thrive, we think about helping our students reflect. Yes, it is powerful and important that you are out there protesting something that you feel proud about, but do you really know the history of the issue that you're protesting about? Have you reflected on other ways that you may be able to engage in activism as Vicky and I have talked about? That's what we do. Also, we help them grow physically, emotionally, and socially so that there's resilience in what they do because that ties into student retention and, and persistence. Also, the skills include being productive, uh, resilience, and also transcending their roles as students here as future leaders. So we have a lot of work to do this year. And I'm very excited about that because everything that we do in student fairs should complement and be integrated with what all of you are doing in your administrative offices and also academic programs. So I am thrilled to be here. Again, my name is Raymond O, oh, uh, and I'm in the MCG um, a Butler Pavilion of uh, Suite 400. It's the Butler Building. And if you think Harry Potter and the stairs that get you in the maze, eventually you will get to me. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. We're so delighted to have you here.
Our next leader, who we're very exciting about, is Evelyn Thimba, our new Vice President for Undergraduate Enrollment Management. Raymond, I love how you're making me look bad. I'm in MCG, fourth floor. I don't even know where the bathroom is yet. Um, but I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to join you all. Thank you so much, Ashley, Jeff, and the whole team that has worked on this really exciting um, summit on an incredibly important topic for, for all of us. I am Evelyn Thimba. Um, and I am eager, I'm happy to serve in the, in the capacity of Vice President for Undergraduate Enrollment. Um, most recently, I'm joining AU from Drexel University, where I served as Senior Vice President for Enrollment Management. And at Drexel, I think that is where my kind of philosophy and, and passion for the student life cycle grew. That is where it, it became really apparent that the work we do in enrollment and admissions has to be intricately, intricately connected to all of the other work happening on campus. So you'll hear me use uh, student life cycle management a lot because that is exactly what we have to do. I'm excited to be working very closely with Ashley, with Vicky, with Raymond to really think about who we are recruiting, how we are recruiting them, what stories we are telling them, and then what they will find here to, su to support them. So I, I was at Drexel for seven and a half years. Um, I will not say that this is the most complex place I have been because uh, trust me, Drexel is definitely that place. Um, we had 15 different colleges three different calendars, quarter system, semester, you name it. So I, I, when I got here, I was like, oh, wow, like there is normalcy in higher education. Like this is, this is really normal. I'm so very excited to be, to be here. And then prior to uh, my time at Drexel, I was at NYU for about 17 years, all in admissions. Um, and my time there kind of can be punctuated by um, several uh, level, like I worked in every, every different um, role in an admissions office, um, and then took about eight years of my time there where I dedicated all the work, my passion, my advocacy for on um, enrollment for diversity initiatives and community relations. So that is what I have built my career on. You'll, you'll see that all of the work that we are doing and why it's important for us to do this work um, um, as we continue to fill our halls with uh, students from all different backgrounds, et cetera. So NYU was, was that place and was also, is also my alma mater. So I was there for quite a while. Um, and then um, the other role that I, that I wear that is even more important than all of those is that I'm a mother of three men. I've been saying three boys all my life and now I realize that's probably not a good way to say it. My youngest turns 21 in a couple of weeks. So um, Matthew is a rising senior at, in College Park, University of Maryland. Jeremiah and Alex um, live and work in New York City. So that is me in a nutshell. I think one of the things that I was asked to really talk about is this connection between admissions and enrollment management and retention. And I think one of the things that I'm trying to make sure is kind of rolled into the language as we are thinking about enrollment. Enrollment is not just what we do at the, at the beginning. So when we talk about retention, that is part of enrollment. Graduation is all part of, um, of enrollment because retention is um, at, at, at its very core is an outcome that's impacted by every single person on this campus. From A, the people who first and foremost tell the story, the people who write our brochures and kind of tell the story on the website, everything that happens in the admissions office in terms of selection and evaluation, everything that happens in, during welcome week and onboarding, every, every process that we put in place um, is, is, is impacts the outcome on, on retention. And so I think that's one of the things that I wanna continuously, I, I have to start on my team, the Office of Enrollment, to make sure that they are constantly thinking about, okay, how are we, uh, uh, impacting retention because in their in in the way that they have done their work they've been thinking about okay how do we admit a class 
but I want them to think about how do we admit our future alumni? How do we make sure that the students we're recruiting are going to be the students who we're gonna be speaking to five, six years down the road as they are um, um, eagles, uh, eagles for life. So it is also the true test of our institutional capacity uh, for, and, and collaboration. How we connect the dots within our own administrative and academic offices is, is exactly how students are going to be able to thrive on our campus. So how, how the processes and the policies that we are building, are we, are we taking them into, are we making sure that they are all student-centered, right? And that, that also begins in our office. How are we making sure that our application is really telling the student, this is the kind of community you're going to join. So a lot of work um, that we're going to be doing there. I I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention that in addition to um, retention just being an institutional responsibility and ethical imperative when a student says I am coming to AU and I'm going to make this financial investment it is upon us to make sure that at the end of that that student has that diploma that certificate so for me I think it's something that is an ethical imperative as we are thinking about the work we're doing. It also allows us to improve things like rankings and reputation, right? That is important for us as we're thinking about who we are in this incredibly competitive landscape of higher education. How do we make sure that we're connecting um, the dots so that students not only are thriving here, but I end up being our long-term lifelong ambassadors. And then the last piece, um, and, and it's one that we have to talk about um, here is that uh, as it is it is more um, expensive for us to recruit a new student than to keep the students we have. There is a bottom line implication on, on net revenue when our students leave. And I won't share it here, but I've been, cal you know, you, we have to make those calculations. Every 1% drop um, of our students means that we are not realizing revenue that we've worked so hard to bring into the university. So I think the last piece that I want to just share is that as we are thinking about retention, you know, at its at its core and Raymond you are losing you're, you're not doing your job you're supposed to play that academy music when I went over my three minutes I am sure I've gone over my three minutes uh, but I just want to say that you know at, at, at its core retention is a function of two things right and we've I've already shared this who we bring in the students that we are bringing in and then our institutional capacity to make sure that we are educating and supporting them Right, and that if if you take out everything else, those are the two things we need to focus on, um, and who we bring in is one of is going to be one of my greatest focuses here. Is how are we making sure that our value proposition, our real value proposition, is being articulated to students so that when they get here, right, they are they are, they are getting exactly what we told them they were going to get. We're matching our story to their expectations because that is one of the many ways that we can uh, we can fail students. Is we told them they were going to come and get this, but really this is um, this is what they got. And then everything else is everything that you all have been working so diligently in, um, and and with with Ashley's um, great leadership. So I am excited to be here at AU. Um, I'm excited for preview day on Friday. I hope to see many of you there. I'm, 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 I'm writing my, my talking points for preview day and hoping and praying I don't say, welcome to Drexel University. That, that's going to be my biggest nightmare for the next few days, but thank you so much. Thank you for this. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much, Evelyn, and thank you for choosing American University to bring your expertise and talents to. All right, well, our next introduction is more of a reintroduction, and I want to welcome in this new role as acting provost, Vicki Wilkins. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, and welcome to everyone and to everyone online. It's exciting to be here, and if I haven't met you, I hope to very soon. I'm Vicki Wilkins, and I'm excited to be in this role, and I just want you to know that this, what you're experiencing right now, is so AU. I want you to know that at other places, people aren't spending the waning days of their summer coming together around the care 
of their students, around the well-being and the su success of their students. We've been in those places and they care a lot, but it's not the same. It's special here. And I just want you to know that we recognize that. And I honor the fact that you're here today online or in person uh, to be part of that because it is really important part of our story. And I also know that it hasn't been easy the last few years. I think COVID uh, for me, as somebody who really uh, enjoys the part of my job that's taking care of people, it became very hard to do that. And I know many of you have that same passion because of the jobs you've chosen, the place where you're serving. And um, it's not only been hard because they haven't been here for us to take care of, but now that they are, we don't quite know them as well. And it seems a little different than it was before. And so I really respect the fact that we're together today to talk about that and figure out how we move forward in these new times. I also know though that they thrive when we thrive. And so even though you're here on a waning day of summer, I hope you still find a few days more to take care of yourself, have a little downtime, recharge and think about how you thrive here so that we can embark that onto our students. So that's what I wanted to say to you this morning. I'm very excited. I won't I won't miss my extra roles. I am a mom, and although I think my daughter may have reached the age where she wouldn't like me to say her name her age all the time. She's 29, but uh she so I might have to stop doing that. It's not like when they're a baby and you're like six weeks, eight weeks. No, she's 29. Uh, but more importantly, well not more importantly, don't ever say I said that, but my the the, the uh, child you might meet of mine is my very poorly behaved rescue dog named Gitchy. So if you see me with a little dog and I'm kind of pulling her away, it's because she's not all that great with people, but we're working on it. But I do just, again, thank you and honor you for being here. I look forward to the year ahead. We're going to do great things. I have great people to work with and all of you and uh, thanks and have a great day. I'm bringing up Bridget and Jeff. We're going to tell you about their day. Uh, very happy to have them come up. Welcome to Bridget. Always good to have Jeff in his new role here. Come on. <laughs> here you go. So we, I get to have a partner up here, which is fun. So I'm I'm Bridget Trogdon. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about the day and the overview of the day. Um, so this is us. So I'm Bridget Trogdon, new Dean of Undergraduate Education and Academic Students of Purposes. What? I got a woo woo. Okay, this is the best place ever. Um, and and Jeff Brown, interim assistant vice president of student affairs. And so we wanted to get a chance to talk to you just a little bit. Um, this was on the reservation form, which CTRL did all the work for, and they're doing so much. That is there's a huge woo-woo. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, in, including the people who are online and doing all the tech support, which I'll talk about in a minute. So just you know, the, in the res reservation form. We also had just a little short paragraph of why we're here. And, you know, I love how everybody this morning has talked about that and connected back to it. I find myself in the role here saying the word ecosystem multiple times a day um, because, you know, we we are not conveyor belts where a student passes through and, and we, you know, mold them into one kind of thing. We're all a part of that. And so our students all have an ecosystem of support. So along with that, this is not the only time this year we're going to be having these conversations about student well-being about thriving. Um, and so we do have, by tomorrow morning, I think you'll be getting a survey that also has a box if there are some other kinds of conversations, if there are some offices that aren't talking today that we wanna have a chance to engage with some more, let us know about that. So this is not the only time we're gonna talk about it, but I also reiterate August 2nd, and it's beautiful outside, as opposed to last week, um, there are lots of other things you could be doing, so thank you for being here. So. In terms of tech support and Q&A, so mostly people who are online, um, you know, so thank you all for joining us. And uh, it, we went ahead and activated the chat function that lets you talk to each other just kind of as a back channel as things are going on, or if you have a question, or if you want to reiterate a point, um, make sure that you're using that. But if you also have a, a question that you want to put in, the Q&A function in Zoom is also active. And so you should be able to put in that question. And um, there are people who will then feed that back in and make sure that we have a chance to answer those questions. So we really want people to be able to engage regardless of modality. All right, and Jeff is going to take us through the schedule for the day. Thanks, Bridget. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Good morning to our colleagues uh, around the world, wherever you may be. It's great to have everyone here. Um, as Bridget said, I'm Jeff Brown. I'm serving as the interim vice, uh, excuse me, interim assistant vice president for student affairs uh, and happy to be working with this group that, to bring this for you today. 
I do want to take a moment and just say thank you to Vicki, to Evelyn, to Raymond, and also President Burwell for being here. That was really important, uh, we thought, as a planning group to introduce um, them to you and to be able to hear from them. So thank you all for being here this morning. I know everyone has some really busy schedules, so thank you. Before we do a real quick walkthrough of the schedule, and just so you know what is going on for the rest of the day, I do want to just provide you and give a few shout outs and recognize some of our supporting offices and sponsors for um, today. So first off, our Office of Undergraduate Education and Academic Student Services, UAES, we'll, we'll cover the acronyms here, um, our Division of Student Affairs, I guess we go by DSA, <laughs> uh, our Center for Teaching, Learning and Research, CTRL, um, and these last two are going to need a little help here. Our Office of the Provost, we need a, we need a good acronym there. Um, and then lastly, but certainly not least, our Office of Undergraduate Enrollment. So thank you to all of those offices and divisions for the support of our summit. Um, I do want to do a quick shout out to the members that were part of the planning group. So uh, first off, Bridget Trogdon is our Dean of Undergraduate Education and Academic Student Services. Um, Ashley Prelu, our Assistant Vice President for Retention and Student Success. Um, Anna Olson in the very back, our um, interim executive director of CTRL. And also last but not least, I think she is online, but Alexis Glasgow, who is our actually in a new role as academic integrity coordinator. Um, so thank you to all of them. Lastly, very quickly, just two quick shout outs to one to Jonah Hyatt from the Office of the Dean of Students for helping us out with logistics. And also to Lindsay Studer from CTRL for all of her technical background and helping us out with all the things that we didn't know how to do. So thank you all so very much. So very quickly about what the day is going to look like today. So I think most of you realize uh, that are here in the room that the morning will be in person. We do have about the same number of folks, if not a few more watching us live stream. So thank you all for doing that. Shortly, we will move to our session that is the State of Undergraduate Students at American University, led by Ashley, as well as our Associate Dean, um, Jimmy Ellis. We'll have a quick 10-minute break, really just to grab something to drink, restroom break, uh, for those of you that are here in person as well as at home. And then following that at 11.05, we will move to our session on uh, mental health and wellness at American University. We will wrap up the morning in person here with a closing from our acting provost, Vicki Wilkins. Um, and once we get to the noon, we will have about an hour and a half for, for lunch. So I encourage you, if you are seeing colleagues, and as I know many of you are today for the first time in person, perhaps a little quick lunch date might be appropriate. Hopefully we gave you enough time to do that. Or if you desire to go and do the afternoon somewhere else, you'll have that opportunity to be in place for the afternoon sessions that start at 1.30. Um, you will see that, oops, at 1.30, we will have our first breakout sessions. And as you saw in the registration form, there are four different options. Those four options will repeat. So at 1.30, as well as 2.20. So be thinking about which are the two you'd like to attend, maybe which two are most relevant to the work that you do, or maybe the ones that will provide you the most learning opportunity to kind of expand your portfolio. Choose those two sessions. And then when you are logged on, you will be directed to the appropriate rooms uh, for the afternoon. The end of our session or the end of our summit is going to wrap up at 310 with which I think will be a really exciting and really beneficial um, session that'll be a student panel. So we have about five-ish, six students from across the university that are going to share what they want us to know about them as we start this school year. Bridget is going to moderate that. We've um, provided them with some questions, but I think, we, I think that's gonna be a real treat for you to hear from those students um, as we start off this school year. So with that, um, that is your overview. Uh, myself, Bridget, Anna, we will be around throughout the morning if you have questions that we can help you with. We encourage you to ask those questions. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Jimmy Ellis and Ashley to come to the stage to kick us off for our first session. So thank you all for being here and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, Bridget and Jeff. We really appreciate not only the introduction, but the entire help, right, that went behind the scenes of this whole day. So thank you all so much for your dedication. Um, I am going to start us off with just some brief introductions. Again, I'm Ashley Prelo. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Student Success, Thriving, and Retention. And here's my colleague. 
Hey everybody, I'm Jimmy Ellis, Associate Dean of Undergraduate Education. I work in the Office of Undergraduate Education and Academic Student Services. And we are here to talk about the state of our undergraduate students at AU, which will encompass a number of different topics. We want to give you a sense of where we are from a number standpoint, but we know the numbers are not everything. So we wanna dive a little bit deeper and talk about all of these terms that you all keep hearing, student success, retention, thriving, what does that mean? And how do we apply those principles to American University on an ongoing basis? And the third topic that we wanna cover and make sure that everyone here online or in person walks away with is just our next steps as a community. What's our charge? What do we need to be thinking about as our incoming students you know, come on campus and we have that fresh opportunity to engage them in the right way and a way that fosters their success? So with that, I want to start by having Jimmy talk a little bit about our incoming students. All right, everybody, before I get started on that, I, I just wanted to spend a minute and say, uh, the perspectives that you'll see and that I'll talk about are really informed by the connections and the people that I work with on the campus. And uh, in our office, uh, I work very closely with a few teams. I just want to shout out, because I realized over the summer I was talking with students, I would tell people, that you don't work with offices, right? It's not nameless, faceless, kind of spiritless places. You're generally working with people all along the way. And so with that in mind, just a couple of shout outs. So first year advising, uh, led by our associate directors, Joseph DeVos, Arthur Stallworth, uh, Janice Sabdumas, and uh, Rachel Wupong. I also work closely with our academic support teams, led by senior director Nishan Green. Uh, we have our academic coaching. We have one academic coach in the room. What's up, Michelle? Um, also leading our, our peer-led academic supports, including supplemental instruction, um, uh, um, the writing center, um, then peer assisted student support. Uh, I work closely with our AUX team, led by Izzy Stern, uh, again a, a colleague that we have great respect for and, and admire. Uh, Beza Jalali in quantitative support, and then also reporting through uh, my apparatus is uh, Aaron Saunders, who are, is our director of student athlete support. So, again. When I think about this year, I just want for our students and for our communities to really understand the visibility and the transparency that God, we're just not offices just kind of clanging and banging against each other. We're people that are working together. So I just want to give that a little bit of voice. Um, okay, so on behalf of colleagues of enrollment, they asked me to share some uh, incoming statistics of our, of our cohort. And this is where I'll emphasize some time and energy now. Um, looking at uh, the profile of students coming in, we're expecting a cohort of about 1,850 students. Uh, that's in line with some expectations that we had as the summer had progressed. Um, everywhere else that you look demographically, kind of where students are situated, it is similar to what we've seen in previous years. As I scan this and look back at previous presentations, I don't see many surprises. Um, when you look at the gender breakdown of our institution, our institution has always been one that has um, been majority female for, for the past several years, and we see that uh, categorized that way as well. The past few years, the average GPA, high school GPA of incoming students has been in that high 3.7 to low 3.8 range. We're seeing that as well. Um, when you look at the uh, racial breakdown of our incoming students, um, students of color, which are our Asian students, our Black African American students, and Hispanic Latinx students, that combined percentage has equaled between 30 and 33% for the past few years. And if you add those up, you'll see that that's the case again this year. A lot of consistency in the kind of approach that we take to recruit our students and the students that are enrolling. About 206 um, students identify as being first generation or we identify them as first generation. That's an identity that we come to know and understand better as they engage with us at the institution. And so certainly through the application process, we categorize students that way based on their parental or their parents' educational attainment. But we know that's an identity that some students wear and share uh, once they get here. And so we adapt and, and kind of meet those needs as they arise. Um, that has historically in the last few years been between 10 and 12% of our population. And we see those similar rates as well. Um, students from 47 states, uh, students from DC, Puerto Rico, and over 40 countries. Um, uh, this year. And then the breakdown about intended major and intended academic unit is also pretty similar to previous years. If you add up the six academic units, that equals 100%. And if you add the 8% undeclared, that equals 108. So that's too many. <laughs> the undeclared students, though, um, in indicate through the application process uh, an intended area of interest. And so undeclared students are spread throughout the six academic units. Um, this year, over the summer, we've um, noticed some migration between academic units. Um, School of Public Affairs, even after the admissions process, even after the deposit process, is starting to, in the summer, 
um, uh, get traffic into their institution, into their academic unit from the other schools and colleges. We're seeing that migration. Kogad School of Business is also one that seems to be attracting students during the summer transition period as well. And so even through this part of it, we're already seeing some kind of migration um, between the academic units. Uh, and then uh, this year, about 29% of our students were early decision students. Um, and that also tracks to what we've seen in previous years. Looking forward, uh, what do we know about first year students once they get here? Tons, right? Tons. But I wanted to highlight just a few things that I've been tracking and observing the last couple of years and um, to kind of set some foundation and, and, and insight into what we might be seeing with our, with our students. So here's some early insights on that. Um, when AU feels like a place like they belong, and how do I know this? How do I ask this question? Well, during the first semester of a new student's time at AU, during weeks four to five, sometimes into week six, we send out a fall transition survey. It asks a number of questions, and it's a question that we've asked for over 10 years is, um, uh, it, it, do you feel like AU is a place where you belong? Um, and that's a question that's been a bit of a mystery, right? It feels like the right question asked. It feels like it's connected to something that's important. And in fact, when we track student responses compared to whether they return, there is a strong correlation with that. On a one to five scale, students that answer a four or five on that question in week five of their first semester return at 93% the following year. And if you contrast that to the overall retention rate we've seen in the last couple of years of 86 to 88%, that is a meaningful difference. In fact, if you look at students that answer a one or two on that question, the retention rate for those students, a one-year retention rate is 71%. There's a 20-point gap between a student that after five weeks says, this is a place where I feel like I belong, versus this is a place that, I, that, that I'm, I'm struggling to find that connection. So um, I have been trying to figure out, okay, what might students be meaning when they, when they answer this question? So last year, uniquely, I asked just four other questions later on the survey. So I asked them about belonging, I answered uh, some other questions uh, on different topics, and I hit them with these four kind of wild card, unique questions. And here's what I found. So first of all, about 1,200 students completed this survey. Um, 694 of them answered a four or five on AU is a place where I belong. I feel like I belong. I asked the question and I asked them to what extent they agree with this uh, from one to five. Um, four is very, five is extremely, one is like not, uh, is a little. I asked them, my experience with AU aligns with how AU promotes itself. If a student were to answer a four or five on the belonging question, 66% of them answered a four or five on this statement. My experience with AU aligns with how AU promotes itself. The next one I asked, just curious, is being an AU student means a lot to me. Again, students answering a four or five highly on the belonging question, about two thirds of them also answered highly on being an AU student means a lot to me. The next area I was interested is, is I have someone at AU that cares a lot about me. Again, these are kind of ambitious questions to ask so early but students had opinions on them. Again, students answering high on that belonging question, 78% of students said, I have someone at AU that cares a lot about me. They answered a four or five. And the options are very and extremely, like I really want people to like hesitate to put a five. So I, I put extremely there and we're getting fours and fives on this question. And this next one is just kind of like kind of me <laughs> reflected, I think in personality in the question. But I asked question, um, I can see a bright future for myself at AU. And if a student answered a four or five on that question, 92% of them also answered a four or five that I can see a bright future for myself at AU. That is extraordinary. You, that overlap and that connection is just incredible. Um, and even if they're wrong or right or misguided or whatever, what I realized is it doesn't matter. That belief matters. They could be completely wrong. But if they believe it, it matters a lot, and, and I'm seeing that in the data. Now, I did want to spend a couple minutes to talk about the alternative. Okay, so what happens when students answer a one, two, or three on that belonging question? We had about 560 students that answered a one, two, or three on that question. And for those students, the differences are quite stark. And this is new information to me, and I don't know what to make of it because I'm just looking at the data now. Like we're doing it very descriptively right now. We haven't really dug into some what the mechanics might be, but descriptively it is stark. 
on that, uh, we'll start from the bottom and work our way up. Actually, I'll, I'll pull them all up at the same time. For I can see a bright future at AU, only 39% of students that answered lower on that question also said, I can see a bright future for myself at AU. For 42% of students that answered low on that question, um, they said they had someone at AU that cares a lot about me. Now this is starting to feel wild to me because they are moving through the same AU, the same strategy, the same approaches, the same pathways, the same ways in and et cetera. Yet after five weeks, there can be these stark differences to the experience that they say that they're having at, on the transition survey. The next one, being an AU student means a lot to me. Only 22% um, of students that answered low on that question of belonging say that being an AU student means a lot to me. And only about a quarter of students say that my experience at AU aligns with how AU promotes itself. And so I bet your minds are running about what some of these correlations and mechanics and experiences might be, and mine does too. And so this isn't, an, a, a, I think, a slide with answers. I think it's a slide that asks questions that I hope we can explore this today and, and going forward. Okay, on the other side of the slide, I'm like notorious for like packing slides, but going through them slowly. <laughs> All right. So when students feel they might leave AU, so on that same survey, I asked about their intention to return to AU the following year during weeks four and five, okay? Um, and I asked students at that time, you can imagine at that time, uh, uh, the majority, the vast majority of students are not planning to leave AU in week four or five, right? But nevertheless, over a two-year period, almost 200 students answered a one or a two on my five-point scale that they were planning to leave AU. Um, students can select as many reasons as they like on the options that I give them, and 60% of students, in fact, pick multiple reasons um, from what you're about to see. These definitely don't equal 100%, right, because of the multiple reasons thing. So I put it all up here at the same time. 70% uh, of students that answer lowly on that intent to return question say they desire a different social environment. About 47% or half are indicating academic related reasons. So 47%, and then if you break that down, 25% or 25 say they want a different academic program, oftentimes one that we don't have here or one that they have come to evaluate as being better elsewhere. That's 25%. 16% want a more challenging academic environment and 6% want a less challenging academic environment. But taken in totality, academic reasons uh, based on the uh, options that I give them make about half of the, uh, of half of students are answering in that way. About a third want a different location. This is uh, hard for us to change. Uh, the, 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 the university is where it is. Uh, but of course we can affect their perception attitude about it, right? About, about what it means to be here. Now that's a surprising one for a lot of colleagues that know our data about our students well, because um, our location is often by far the reason why students come to AU. And to see it pop up for 30% of students that are thinking about leaving as being why they want to leave, we talk about an expectations gap or experience gap, that's huge from what's happening. I think that could be quite devastating. Imagine that being your top reason why you wanted to come, but then after five weeks, it's, it's dissatisfied in a certain way. I think that delta is probably maximized and amplified because of that high expectation coming in about what AU is going to mean to you or what the location of AU is going to mean to you. And then finally, financial issues um, make up about 30%, that there's something financially about being here that's making it tough, and that's a reason I would leave. Now, I will say that I believe financial issues in week five are underestimated. Because why? Because when we talk to students later on in their experience, financial issues are a dominant issue. But does a student who oftentimes in my study is 18, 19, have a full sense of what the financial conditions are and how it's gonna affect them then? They probably don't. They probably are more focused on the academic and the social piece and what it's like to be here. And so I'll just put an arrow up here that that is underestimated. This becomes a dominant and major feature as the experience progresses. Okay. All right, switching gears a little bit and focusing a bit on the academic experience of being at the institution, or maybe this is the academic and social experience of being at the institution, I wanted to highlight a few things that have happened in the last 12 months that I think are strengthening the foundation by which all of our efforts are happening. Um, some of these will feel niche, and they are, but they all started off, I think, with everyday people 
identifying like an everyday issue and working with everyday colleagues to make change and, and, and improve with students at, at the center, especially the first four, which um, have mostly been resolved. So let's take a look at that. So quickly, just identify a few things. If you look at box A about stops and restrictions, um, colleagues got together and said, hey, we understand the university has to be accountable to make sure students are doing what they need to administratively in order to progress to the university. Immunization forms, paying your bill on time, et cetera. However, um, can we get together and make sure that we are working together closely to understand that students have enough information and guidance to resolve stops before they become an issue, that we give students enough of a runway once we place the stop to take action and change, and then are they not on their own to resolve it in advance of a high stakes moment, which might be registration. And for the most part this past year, we've done this. And I feel really good about how that's worked out. Um, B talks about um, major GPA requirements. To be a student at AU, to be in good standing, you have to have a 2.0 GPA or higher. In order to graduate from, a, from the university, you have to have a 2.0 GPA or higher. But prior to March of this year, in order to move between schools and colleges, there were elevated requirements in order to do that. And that makes sense on its face, but if you really break it down, it did have some unintended consequence. If you were a student that happened to, upon admission, select a major that had that elevated requirement, it didn't matter your academic performance whether you could pursue that degree. However, if you were like a lot of students, maybe half our students, who didn't quite have your area of study picked out exactly right, and you wanted to change, you faced a unique barrier and challenge to be able to move to your intended area of study. And this is something that I give a lot of credit to the academic community to come together to resolve and going forward, this is something that has been fixed. Credit thresholds, um, proving that inspiration can come from anywhere. Our colleagues in institutional research, Karen Frosley Jones, just was tracking and noticing that although it's only 12 credits to be a full-time student, we biased when students could register for courses by if they took 15 credits or more. The registration windows are 15, 30, 45, and et cetera. And so on one side, we say, hey, do what you need to do to take the number of credits you need to have on a full-time level because that's good for your well-being, success, and academic experience. But then kind of on the back end, we're saying that could, we don't say, but it did influence the timeliness in which they could register for courses. And Karen noticed this, brought it to our attention, and this is also an adjustment in working with a registrar that we've been able to improve. Course availability is something that's always on our mind, making sure that students have access to relevant um, courses that appeal to their interests, especially early on. And I will say that working with first-year advising for the past few years, um, access and availability is always a challenge and a struggle, but it has felt better this year. And I think students, especially the ones that have been able to engage in the process early, have had a nice exposure to courses that are discipline specific and focused. The last two I'll, 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 um, are, are ones that I'll talk about on a slide and then, uh, and Ashley is gonna actually talk about coordinate care a little bit more later. All right, and uh, the E is aligned advising. Um, and I'll talk about that on this slide here. Everything that you see on black on this slide are things that always existed in the first year advising department. Um, strong relationships for a strong first year, everything focused on a first year student's needs, and then this um, spirit of high frequency of high frequency and quality of interactions with first year students meaning a lot. So if things are in black, these are things that since 2018 have been a priority for the first year advising office. Um, new this year are the things in red. One is that from a student's point of view, the arc of the academic advising experience at the university isn't a process of moving from isn't predominantly a process of moving from one office to another. Advising the university means from going from first year advising to the schools and colleges in my second year. This year, we're working hard to say from a student's point of view, advising should be always have their intended or declared major in mind. That from the start, they know that although I'm gonna have developmentally appropriate, more intensive, more compassionate, focused advising based on my needs in the first year, my progression through the advising experience will always have at its heart my intended area of study, a connection to the school and college in which I intend to pursue my degree. And that's been a big reorientation that happened quickly over the spring into this academic year. We also are spending um, dedicated time and support with uh, students with undeclared uh, majors. The idea there is that instead of distributing students, uh, just a few in uh, across our team, 
we're concentrating those students within the experience of uh, a couple of our senior instructor advisors. And over the summer, these colleagues or these students have received focused, principled, dedicated advising um, that is attentive to that exploratory nature of being an undeclared student. And the final thing is that new this year um, and something that we're, we're piloting this year is that AUX1, which has since the beginning been in a one and a half credit course, is a one credit course. In the past has been 15 weeks, is now 10 weeks. And the idea is there is that we can provide similar timely guidance to students and uh, conclude before the strain at the end of the semester. And honestly, from the point of view of our instructor advisors for the staff, but and also for the students at that time. So that's something we're eager to see how it plays out this academic year. So there's that. Um, and I'll conclude by saying um, nothing else. I think I've said enough. <laughs> and I'll hand it off to Ashley. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy, for that deep dive into our first year students. And now I want to orient everyone here online in person to last year for a minute, right? Looking at our student populations across every class level. I want to, in the same slide, also give a massive shout out to our analytics and technology team, specifically OIRA, Office of Institutional Research and Assessment, because without these numbers, my first 30 days would have been very, very hard starting in February of this year. And so I wanted to learn and uncover as much as I possibly could about the students that were still active on campus, but also about those that left and understanding what story they were telling on the way out that maybe we would have, we, we might've missed, maybe we did know, but we couldn't do anything about it. And so there's uh, power in learning from the past and applying those lessons to the future. And that's the reality of where we are. So when you look across these different colors, the different class levels, and even as Jimmy was talking with that 1850 first years that are coming in starting later this month and into September, we have a real opportunity to keep as many of them as possible for their best interest, as well as for the best interest of this university. Inevitably, inevitably, what happens is that we lose students, not just year to year, but semester to semester. And we need to be thoughtful about how we're tracking that, how we're getting in front of those students as much as we possibly can. And it starts again with that narrative of what's actually happening. What is our student pulse? How are we collecting the student voice across every facet of their student experience so that not only are we learning, but we're able to do something about it? So continuing down this line of data, what I learned very quickly is as a university, we do have some retention challenges. Now, I wanna say that with also the flip side of it, that we're also doing a number of things right. So when you look at this, specifically the blue bars that are focused on our one year retention, to say that in the last year, that fall 2021 class specifically, because we haven't, hit that ad drop period or census to be able to say what our fall 2022 retention is at this particular point, we were at 86.3%. Now, that means that we are obviously retaining the majority of our students. So we are doing many things right. And we need to learn from that as well. However, if you look at the way our retention moves, not just first year, but also now bringing into account the red bars as students move from their first to second to third year, we have some opportunities. And those opportunities include learning from how our numbers look like in the past. So we have often been in the late 80%, right? 86, 87 with the exception of 2020, which was an interesting year, if you all remember. That year, we hit 90.5% retention. And that is something to be very proud about in this room. There were very hard things happening during that time frame, And we can talk anecdotally about why our students were staying with us. What did they see? What risks did they not want to take outside of the university? But what I see is evidence that we can hit that 90% mark. And I see evidence that because we've done it, we have an opportunity to sustain it. So not just hit it, 
but have that be the standard for our students. An American university with the value proposition that we have, the reputation that we have, the people in this room, the people on online, our faculty members who are teaching our classes and spending up to 225 hours with students each semester are the reasons why we have that possibility to make that real time what our retention rates are. So look at this as an opportunity. Look at this as something that proves that we can be exactly where we wanna be. And what that contributes to are setting our students up for success and making sure that when they are retained, that we also have them on a path to thrive. And you all hear me say those words. We are going to spend a lot of time talking about what that means, but retention is just one piece of that. Let's switch gears and talk also about where we are from a graduation rates perspective, because as I mentioned, retention shows us taking steps in the right direction. It shows that we have a commitment to our students to keep our students, but then what happens? What happens after that first year? You all saw that second year, we're losing more students. Even in 2020, we were losing students between that sophomore to junior, or that sophomore to junior year. And then inevitably, some students have trouble graduating. And I don't mean just graduating at all, but graduating within critical timeframes that we consider to be underneath the student success umbrella. So where we're moving, if you look at that red line, that red line shows our four year graduation rates. And if you all are not as data savvy as some of our analytics and technology people in the room, you can see directionally we are moving down in terms of graduation. Now, I wanna acknowledge that some of that was due to the pandemic, specifically students 2018, 2019, who had to take a leave of absence for a number of different reasons. We have an obligation to not only get those students back, but then to take a look at our four and a half year possibilities. Summer is huge. And we, we, we learned from that this year as well having course availability, like Jimmy mentioned for the first years, but also on the back end to be able to say, you are this close to graduation, let us make way for you to be able to get that done over the summer so that you don't have to re-enroll for a full additional year. When that does happen, we are still tracking our five-year graduation rates, which at this particular point are a little bit higher than our four-year rates, which show elements of retention. And while that's promising, to me, again, I see another opportunity. How can we move those that are in that five-year space earlier to four years, again, leveraging summers and other opportunities to get those students either back on track or an opportunity to accelerate towards that four-year mark? When we look at six-year, this is another opportunity that we see. However, six-year has stayed traditionally pretty flat. Um, but what that tells me is that if we actually work backwards from our retention, to say if we can hit that 90% mark for first year retention, why can't we at a six year graduation rate hit 80%, right? Mathematically, it is possible, but we have to be engaging students at every step in the process. Evelyn Thimba earlier in her remarks talked about the student life cycle. We as academics, as folks that are here at American University must study that student life cycle to be able to be proactive but then also to intervene when students, for whatever reason, fall off of this path towards graduation. So when we look at these particular lines, again, please don't be discouraged, right? We are in the rebound period. And nationally, we are seeing many universities struggling with retention, as well as getting their graduation rates up. What I'm encouraged by is our forecasts, our forecasting. So we have an opportunity to be a little bit higher than last year, especially for our four-year graduation rate. We are a little bit lower on the five-year rate, but we have an opportunity to get that up and hopefully above 75%, setting us up for success to hit six-year ultimately at 80% graduation rates. So I understand this is a lot of numbers, but let's unpack it. Let's talk about what we mean when I say we have this opportunity. We can get these rates up, but how? So I wanna engage the audience a little bit because I certainly have some answers, but I wanna know when you all hear the term student success, 
what do you think of? And you all can just shout it out, put it in the chat if you're online. When you hear student success, what comes to mind? Individualized support, what else? Engagement, yes, what else? Ooh, quality of relationships with professors, great. What else? Pride of their work products, fantastic. What else? Helping students find their purpose. That is a good one. We're going to come back to that. <laughs> fun. Yes. Who said fun? All right. Thank you. Because that is a huge piece. All right. And let me just quickly check the chat. Any folks, please submit your ideas. I don't see anything yet. But student success is obviously not easily defined. And we should acknowledge that. It is a question for us as a university, but is also a question individually for each student. And if you think about it that way, there's an opportunity to individualize the student experience. Yes, we have standard services and resources and pathways for all of our students. But when we start to get at the heart of why are you here? What is it that you hope to accomplish? What does success mean to you? Then we are one step closer to being on the right track for those particular students. When we break it down, I mentioned that, if this will work. I mentioned that student success is the question. Retention at this moment at American University, as well as nationally, is the imperative, right? It is a means to how we have an opportunity to make our students successful, but it is not the end all be all. If we say that we retain those students, like you saw on that slide with the bars, the red and, and, and blue bars, our job is not done. It is not complete. Retention is often thought of as a first year process, and that is not the case. I mentioned already we're losing students in that sophomore year, but it also happens at the junior year. And even more unfortunately, it happens at the senior year where students are this close to earning a degree. And so what we need to be thinking about is how do we operationalize retention year over year, semester over semester. And in some cases, especially when we think about registration, week over week, we wanna make sure that these students are showing signs of success based on our university definition, but also based on what they told us. And so in order to do that, we follow this retention process. And this is what I'm really trying to bake into the university at this particular point. Um, it starts with our promise. What did we tell students during that prospective student phase? What is it that their family members, their neighbors, their friends, folks that are in their family networks are telling them about the experience that they will have at American University. And then it moves into the enrollment. How accessible was it to access certain materials to get in, whether it's the application, whether it's talking to someone firsthand about their experience. We know that if students have a strong enrollment experience, then they are more likely to persist, which is another term that tells us that students can move from semester to semester. We also need to know at the same time, even at this period where we're not enrolling students, why did they melt? Why are they not enrolling? What is it that stopped them from signing on the dotted line and, and committing to their time here at AU? But then when they get here to Jimmy's point as well with the surveys and the interactions that we have, why is it that students, even after that first semester or even mid-semester, unfortunately, sometimes leave? We, if we know that, can intervene better. We will understand also the timing of when these things happen to intervene better. But just knowing is not enough. We have to be able to deliver the right type of intervention. And so I want to take this moment to give a very clear example of this. We know we have Gen Z students at this particular point. They digest information differently. They expect information differently. And so knowing that in 2023, we have an opportunity to meet those students where they are. And guess what, folks? It's not always over email, right? We know that. 
So we need to be thinking about additional communication channels to intervene with our students. We need to be thinking about what their coordinated care network looks like, whether it be faculty member, a coach, someone like myself, Jimmy, an advisor, being a part of that coordinated care network. So that way, you know already on hand, who are your T-Mobile favorite five? right? Who is it that you're going to be able to call on when at minimum you have a question, but at maximum you encounter a challenge that could block your success at the university? We also sometimes need to reframe the significance of attrition. I've heard in many contexts that, oh, it's the academic experience. Oh, it's the financial experience. Oh, it's because of the student affairs experience. It is the combination of all of those elements that contribute in many cases to a student wanting to leave the university. But we have to understand what that is. And then if we reframe that, someone like myself in these types of meetings, we stop as a university pointing fingers or looking at one or the other or saying that was on you. We come together to actually look at the entire process looking at the entire student life cycle because it builds on itself. One bad experience to another bad experience to another is how you start to see that snowball effect occur with that student. So it is on all of us in this room to be able to ensure that students are uh, experiencing AU the way that they expect it. Organize. So we certainly need to make sure that we have our ducks in a row. What are our processes? Are they documented? Do we know at what points during the year, and this is something that I'm working on, putting together a student success calendar so we know at what critical points do we need to be paying attention to our students' behaviors, performance, and also signs of success or attrition. We need to be tracking that and distributing that information. So even if I collected it all, I would not be doing my job or my part serving this university. I need to be able to exchange data and exchange stories. I don't wanna undermine the power of our students' stories and the complex issues that they have encountered during their experience. We need to be able to share that more broadly, come together, get our hands on some data, and then circle right back around. That's why this is a whole wheel because that data is going to show us where we fall short of our promises, where we're meeting students where they are with those promises. And then we can continue to make sure that the students from day one are on the right track. When we start to think about retention, again, being that imperative, that process, then it's a part of the overarching student success triangle. There are parts to student success, as I mentioned already, with academic preparedness and planning, making sure that you have a clear path, you know about your major, what courses you need to take, who are going to be those key faculty members that you can lean on and learn from. That is certainly a big part of the value proposition that American University provides. But then there's also this other layer, right, of do you feel like you belong? Are you connecting? Are you a part of student organizations or Greek life, um, a cohort on campus? Things that really will 10 years, 20 years from now, remind you about your experience on campus. And then well-being. We know many of our students are suffering from mental health related matters as well as medical. And so we are the example for those students by sharing ways that we also stay well, that we also are able to take time away, refresh, approach the work with a different mindset is all going to help the overall health of this student while they're attending AU. That is the formula for student success. Again, retention being a piece of it. Now, let's talk about student thriving briefly, right? Because we talked about student success being the question, we know there are elements of student success. We talked about retention being the imperative or the process in which we can ensure or help to ensure our students are most successful. But then there's this other piece, thriving. And quite frankly, in my conversations with folks, I figured out is the most gray, the most gray of areas to try to unpack. What does this mean? This, in many cases, is the outcome that we are shooting for. Just because we retain a student, just because we graduate a student, we provide resources for those students, does not necessarily mean that they have been thriving on campus. 
And what I often try to think about is all the pieces of what we provide, the big pie is how we set students up to thrive. But the reality is we have a number of different students that come from different backgrounds, the diversity aspect of our student body. And if you take those that have been traditionally or historically the most marginalized and put them in the middle of this ring, that's how you can ensure not only are those students thriving, but everyone else at the university is thriving as well. So access to inclusive opportunities, mentorship, peer-led initiatives, whether that's advising, mentorship, residence halls, working with your RA, but also having flexibility to pursue your passions, not just inside the classroom, but outside the classroom. We've talked about experiential learning. Those ingredients are essential for the student's ability to thrive. And in many cases, we have those ingredients here today. We have to do a better job of putting them, putting them in the pot where our students are cooking <laughs> and making sure that they are aware of them, that they understand also what they can get out of it. And sure enough, even when I think back to my undergraduate experiences, because I tapped into these things, I can say that I thrived. You might not realize it in the moment, right? In fact, if we ask some of these questions to students directly, like, are you feeling like you're, you're belonging? You know, are you thriving here on campus? You might get different answers depending on the week. But what we're working towards is a strong alumni base, students who are getting ready to embark on successful careers and look back and thank AU for being a part of that process. That's what student thriving is. And why is this important? And Evelyn, as well as President Burwell, talked a little bit about this, is because the nature of higher education in this country is changing, right? So it's not just AU. We're spending a lot of time focused on AU, but the fact is demographics are changing. We're losing less students that are traditional college age um, that are coming into the university. And so what this means is that the heat has been turned up on making sure that we can be competitive in comparison to other universities, but that also the students are able to see our value proposition clearly and choose AU as a result, despite the shifting demographics, despite the other universities that are in the area specifically, um, they choose AU. That's why we're doing this work. And so Jimmy touched on this a little bit and I don't wanna um, duplicate, but Jimmy was getting a lot of student input as it relates to um, why students stay, why students leave. When I was getting my hands on that data in that first 30 days, I not only saw why students were staying, but it mirrored what students were communicating to us when they were one foot out the door. So financial concerns, no cohort. In fact, 80% of our students at this particular point, as of last year, do not have any affiliation with a programmatic, athletic, or academic cohort. And when you look at those cohort retention rates, they are 90% and higher. So if we can figure out ways to scale this, not just for our first year students, but also for students that are going into that second year and beyond to help make sure every element of retention is strong, then we can improve that for our students as well as their sense of belonging and connectivity to the university. Uh, high performing students, we know we have more of those on campus students with above a 3.5. So while seeing that might not be surprising because we know how great our students are, what is surprising is when we can't keep them. If you look at other universities across the country, many of their students up to 20% are lost on the other end of the GPA spectrum. So for lack of academic performance are reasons why they're leaving, less than 2.5 probation, suspension, et cetera. But we have an opportunity to retain our highest performing students here at AU. And then naturally mental health and medical reasons as well as I mentioned. So what does this mean? Because there's so many pieces to the pie and not all of us own every single element of this. And it's very difficult for us to try to catch all of those different pieces when we have individual interactions with students. And that's important because Jimmy already laid it out, letter F on the previous slide, 
we are moving towards a coordinated care model. And that is not just people. It's not just making sure we have the right people in the room, but it's also the processes, right? It's making sure that we know what those processes are. We've documented those processes and we can say that these are our standard operating procedures. There will always be times where students fall outside of that, but having that transparency across the university of the way that we do things traditionally is gonna be very powerful for us. And then also technology, connecting those dots. I see a lot of manual work. And as much as I love Excel, I love dashboards even more, right? I love to be able to have real-time on-demand analytics. And I love being able to incorporate workflows that we would have process mapped on the process side into these technologies to come full circle, close the loop, and understand where our students are at any given point. That, to me, those three pieces are what's going to solidify a strong coordinated care model. So to wrap us up today, because I know I'm getting very, very close to time and I don't wanna be that person. Um, I just want us to be aligned on our next steps as well as how you all see yourselves, your role in student success moving forward, not just for this year, but beyond. Um, we do have a live retention and graduation plan as of April, 2023. That retention and graduation plan has called out some of the elements that we talked about today but it enforces the need to have more strategic planning in place at this university. And that's across division. It's not just the high level, but it's student affairs piece, it's academic affairs piece. And it's also strategic enrollment management being in some ways an umbrella to help that financial aid piece as well. So we're wrapping around strong financing opportunities for our students to be successful here. We also have a refreshed student thriving and action, I'm sorry, student thriving and retention team, also known as STAR. This is a group of over 30 different leaders uh, from AU Central to financial aid to Dean of Students. You pick somebody across the university and name it, chances are they have someone or someone in their office represented in this group. And the purpose is to talk about the things that I just mentioned earlier, right? That coordinated care network, having enhanced analytics and dashboards, making sure not only do you have access, but you have training on how to leverage those dashboards at the right times. We also have a subgroup, the Eagle Eye team, focused specifically on catching critical cases, as well as intaking critical updates that we need to learn about. So for example, students with uh, that are uh, failing satisfactory academic progress, or students that might be at risk of having their registration canceled um, because of an outstanding balance. Knowing when those things happen, helps us get in front of it and start to create a process in which we can track those students and intervene when necessary. Survey coordination. Um, Jimmy had done a great job laying out the findings from the fall transition survey, but we know in some cases there's survey overload at this university where it's data, data everywhere or there's data nowhere, right? And we need to do a better job of not only coordinating those surveys, looking at the questions, what are we tracking, but then also disseminating those results and those responses so that our offices working underneath the student success umbrella are able to intervene accordingly. And then last but not least, because we did talk about the coordinated care model already, is the ability to have clear, accessible, published standard for your academic pathways that are also linked with experiential learning opportunities for students. So it's not just what do you need to focus on in the classroom? What courses do you need to take? No, it's much bigger than that. It is your whole experience that we want advisors, folks like myself, every area career services to be able to just drill down on the overarching elements that they not only can put on a resume, but they should feel proud about being here at AU. So what is your role? And this is the last slide, folks. So let's take a deep breath for a minute and talk a little bit about what we all can do every day, especially when our students are here on campus. Be present and participate. You all can check that box today. You're learning about what we're doing and how these pieces connect to retention, but you're also thinking internally about your role and how when you interact with students, you're present, you're participating, you're helping those students. We want to listen to the student voice. And I really mean that. I, 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 and it's not just at the student government meetings or random meetings that we have throughout the year. It's one-on-one -on -one 
sit down to understand the experience, not just what they need, what issue they have. How are you? Are you getting everything that you imagined as part of your AU experience? Providing feedback and reporting student concerns, that is definitely essential for us to try to help those students. Advocating for student-centered change, not just change. We know there are many places where we need to evolve and do things or think of things differently, but we have to be thinking about that in a student-centered fashion. Building meaningful bonds. I think back to so many of the mentors, faculty members that I engaged with as part of my experience, that makes all the difference in many cases as to whether or not a student will stay or leave. Cultivating genuine but contagious affinity to AU, they pick up on it, especially our Gen Z students. If you are not energized to be here, they will know. If you're faking it, they will know. And so we have to think about our own well-being as staff and faculty and what gets us up in the morning and energized to do the work that we do and keep that going, sustain that, be and have that endurance. And lastly, someone mentioned it earlier, which is have fun. As much as we put that on our students, we also, as I'm standing up here, I am having a great time with y'all. <laughs> I'm having a great time to be able to preach this message and get these points across. But when you all leave this room, when you leave this summit, think about what, again, is the most fun parts of your job. And in many cases, I bet you'll say it's the connection with students. So foster that. And with that, I'm going to ask you all one final question, which is whose job is it to ensure our students are successful? Everyone, all right, I did my job here today. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. And we will be moving towards a break. Uh, I have taken five extra minutes, so please forgive me, but we will reconvene at 11.05.